Um, awesome. Well, you know, everybody, um, this is the weekly appliance repair roundtable call. I'm the host and moderator. We hold these every Thursday evening. Um, and I'll be recording this call so that if you guys wanted to reference anything, you'll be able to access it. And then also the people that aren't able to attend uh, will be able to, uh, will be able to um, take advantage. Um, I'm just sending Bobby Howard a quick text message. He's going to be leading. Um, so the way that these calls right now, we're playing with a little bit of structure. The way that these calls are structured is that we're going to be um, we're going to be spending about the first third of the call um, on uh, like uh, interpreting tech sheets or this week, Bobby's going to be going over his sort of approach with diagnostics. Um, and uh, just a, an overall sort of um, basic tech 101, um, uh, I guess, piece or component that he wanted to talk about. And he thought it would be helpful for those um, that, uh, that are newer or just uh, could, don't do the best with uh, reading tech sheets. Um, and then we'll kind of transition into a more open sort of Q&A, just open roundtable format. Um, so if you guys have any questions or any thoughts, anything you want to share with the, uh, the team or bounce off of everybody else here, um, that would be the time. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you don't, then that's fine. But uh, letting you know now that that'll be the sort of the second and third portion of the call. So um, maybe start thinking of some things that you wanted to, uh, to share and tap into with everyone. Um, awesome. So it looks like Bobby is here and um, we can go ahead and kick off this, um, this sort of teaching and learning uh, component of the beginning of the call. Bobby, I don't know if you wanted to sort of set the stage for everybody before you jump in or, or if you'd like to just uh, go for it. Um, you're going to want to unmute yourself, Bobby. Can you hear me okay? Sorry, guys, I just got in uh, like maybe 15 minutes ago and wife already had dinner. So I had to hurry up and fly and try to get through these things. Um, so I know a lot of you guys are doing the tech classes and going through and learning schematics and doing this and that. Um, but for the most part, senior technicians, um, you know, trying to do a training course for that. Uh, a lot of people aren't there yet. So most of the time when you talk about, you know, training, it's going to be basics. So that's what I thought I would try to cover over a little bit today on, you know, what are the, you know, the, the fundamentals, you know, of a technician 101, if you will. So um, the most important things are always going to be, you know, number one, safety. Uh, trying to cover through those. Uh, second thing is going to be, you know, identifying, you know, component failure and operations. And then finally, you know, like um, your, your PR skills, you know, and communicating that failure with the customer. So trying to do all this inside of 20 minutes, um, we'll see how we can do it. Um, so the first couple things, um, it should be standard in every technician's uh, you know, truck uh, is gonna be your safety gear. Whether or not that would be your cut rating gloves, um, usually like, a, what is it, a cut rating five, I think it is, you know, for your, for your gloves. Um, protective floor cover, uh, most importantly, going to be um, moving blankets, uh, something to be able to set stuff down, your tool bag or your booties for your, your, your feet for the customer. Trying to protect yourself, not get hurt and not damage the customer's you know, uh, home is always going to be our utmost importance. Who cares if we fix it if we did $5,000 worth of damage? Uh, so that's always going to be the first one. Uh, if you're unsure about taking something apart or if you haven't taken it apart before, wear your gloves. I mean, you get hurt, you get uh, injured or anything like that. Now you're, now you're out for two weeks. It doesn't do you any good or, or the customer or the company you're working for or yourself. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to steamroll through this really quick. I, I had to rush here and turn this on. Um, you take your time. If we need to take more time, it's totally fine. No, it's fine. I just don't want to go too fast and just push through everything. So uh, operations. Well, if you guys are uh, brand new to it, um, basically like the people that come onto my truck, um, mostly are green. Occasionally you'll get a, you know, really good season tech. And at that point, you're only teaching them software or, you know, the you know company policy. But for the most part, it's going to be a green technician. 
So with a lot of the green technicians, um, I usually like to run through it as we're driving to each one of the calls, you know, pull up the ticket, you know, read about it, have that mental image of your head on what the possibilities are, what you're going to look for, what you're going to test for. And how these basically break down is um, when I was a technician in the 90s uh, working on TVs um, and going to school for it, we learned a thing called B plus signal flow signal function. Now, all you 30 year old tech or 30 year technicians out there will probably know that if you did TV world. Um, so trying to adapt that over to appliances, I came up with a thing called CPO. And CPO is pretty simple. It's command, power and operations. So any component, it does not matter unless it's like you're talking about a system, in which case, you know, like sealed system work, that'll be something a little different. But, you know, if a unit doesn't have power, it's not going to work. If the unit doesn't have a command to function, it's not going to work. And if the unit cannot operate properly, it's not going to work. So um, identifying those three things when you're looking at for something. The second correlation is going to be uh, the relativity of that component. If you're looking for something, let's take a electric dryer, for example, prime, prime example, customer's complaint is a no heat. You know, what are three functions required to make that dryer have heat? Well, you gotta have proper voltage. We need 240. We don't have that. There's no point in even taking it apart, right? But how many times did technicians rip through it and find out there's nothing wrong with the dryer and there's a problem with the voltage because they didn't check that first. So, you know, it's um, going through and having a standard one, two, three operation um, will define you as a technician and it'll help build your um, uh, technical skills uh, moving through it, especially if you're gonna be working on multiple things uh, throughout the day, having one simplistic um, uh, approach to be able to identify anything. So CPO works for me. Uh, after you guys work for a, a long time and you develop your own technique, Go for it. it what, what works good for everybody. I try to find something simple because um, I, at heart, I'm just like everybody else. I'm lazy. So trying to find uh, what works best is usually the main way to go. So in any functionality, whether or not it's ice maker, dryer, um, uh, wash machine, um, the CPO uh, uh, steps usually take care of the operations and you're able to com you know, commend it over. So if you wanna look at three functionalities for each you know, identifying item. If you're looking at an ice maker, what are the three you know, you know, properties you know, for that ice maker to function? You know, temperature, water flow, and uh, voltage, right? Other than that, it'll, it'll standalone operations, it'll work by itself. So if you don't have one of those three, you're able to identify that problem and troubleshoot it. So going through those three steps is usually what's going to uh, help isolate and determine component failure or uh, failure of the a device to that you're there to service. Um, do we have any new techs in the house? Oh, guys, just check to see if you're muted and feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, I fairly do. What do you what do you find is the hardest thing for you to work on as a technician? Washers. Washers? Yeah. It takes it takes me a while to diagnose them at least. Be, are you talking like uh, beside the simple things like uh, no drain or uh, no power? Well, not the simple, uh, not the simple stuff. No drain, just whether that's a you know motor problem. I done got to the point to where I can understand if there's a the bearings are bad or something like that. Um, it's just, I haven't ran into like the real complex stuff yet in washers. Mm -hmm. There are some out there. I just spent two and a half hours on a clutch assembly. So yeah, I mean, there, there can be some yeah. that can be a real pain in the butt. Yeah, that's what I haven't ran into Come yet. Come on. So, um, uh, any, like anything else, you know, experience is really going to be the, you know, the, the thing to push you through and, and, you know, get you over that edge, you know, to where, you know, you get a, a hundred of them under your belt, you know, you, you'll, you'll become more seasoned to it. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, like wash machines, uh, what, what is the most common thing that you're having issues on, like unbalanced loads or making noises? I had, I did a bearing job, but then I did a, 
it was the spring, what were the suspension springs, the four springs. Yeah. I didn't know whether they were bad or not. I just went ahead with their stick and changed them. But I haven't had a call back from custody yet, so apparently that worked. I, so I, didn't really, I didn't really know what to look for. I know if they're unbalanced, you, it's got to be either the springs or you got to have uh, either the uh, bearings are bad. You know, I, so know how, that. I just didn't know what to look for in the springs. How do you identify a bad suspension on a top load washer? Yeah, like the springs. Right. No, I'm asking. Yeah. Um, how, how, how do you identify a bad suspension on a top load washer? On the top load, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Is I don't, I don't. Either I'm gonna get the uh, the error. That's that's why I try to check first if I get an error or something. So, so uh, to give you an example, like if I go to a top load washer and I get a complaint of um, it's noisy, it's banging, um, it's incompleting loads, it's getting unbalanced errors. Um, the first thing I'm going to check is going to be is it is a unit level. Level. Yeah. Yeah. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spin the basket manually and make sure I don't have a warped drum. Okay. And the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to push that basket down with my hand and compress it, let go. That's to see if it floats. And to see if it bounces. Okay. You, uh, if that, that, that washer should be able to come down, come right back up and hold. If that, uh -huh. if that washer is real springy and bouncy and it's jumping right back up and you can see it shaking, um, that's an unbalanced suspension. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. I, mean, so, I mean, within, you know, two minutes of being in that, in that house testing, you can kind of get a good idea about what you're looking for. Um, just because you're, you're, you're trying to eliminate the obvious, you know, yeah. break, break down the things that, you know, so even if you're not there, if you're there to troubleshoot a no power on a washer, push down that basket and see like, Oh, that's a good one. Uh, well, as you're going through and you're learning these things, you're going to be able to um, uh, experience and identify the difference between a bad part and a good part. So how, how was you able to identify the clutch, bad clutch? Um, they're going through the unit. Um, the, the unit was knocking and grinding as it would uh, try to spin up and eventually led to, um, you know, a loud bearing on. It was an actual an LG top load you know, unit. Mm -hmm. So when I took off that main rotor on the bottom and I pulled that rotor off the bottom of that uh, motor, I was able to see the clutch and you could see the spline and uh, there it was all, you know, kind of busted and ripped up. Yeah. And the actual in, uh, uh, clutch uh, engage uh, lever was broken on one side. So it was allowing it to tilt and, and turn. So it wasn't able to lock up in place properly. Okay. So granted that one took me 15 minutes to you know diagnose and look at and tilting it back before I started getting underneath it to you know really go through it but I mean you can't expect to walk in and just lay your hands on a unit and say oh I know what this is this is what that is and you know and you you're super tech you know coming right out of the gate and be able to do everything in you know two minutes yeah yeah I do I do uh I do the commercial side do it for a company I work for like a uh, commercial uh, refrigeration, so and also like fryers and all that. And then I still, I got my own company where I do like home residential washers, dryers, you know. So yeah, it's, I've had the company for about four or five months. So I'm TK just posted a link for everybody if you want to be able to uh, see on, you know, an, an actual live video on how to be able to test suspension rods. Okay, cool. I just saw that come up. Yeah. Uh, so um, a lot of uh, different people will check for different ways. Um, some technicians are, are continuity people. Um, they do not uh, look at resistance. They just go by continuity. Um, I'm a resistance tech. So I want to see numbers. I want to see a, you know, a dryer heating element reading 11 ohms. I want to see a oven bake element reading, you know, 19 or 33 ohms. Uh, to me, that makes a big difference especially when I'm trying to identify um, a sluggish, you know, coil or something, you know, something that's, you know, or a, a bake igniter that's, that's off by a hundred ohms. You know, the difference of that thing running 3.2 amps or 2.7 amps is going to be, you know, epic. Oh, and look, there's TK and his beard. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so so when you check for when you when you check for ohms um so when you own when you ohm it out does it does that um does that because i you know i, I found in some instances that even though uh ohm ohm uh, um a part out and it ohms out for me but it's it's like okay i came across the um sub zero the, the water inlet valve it ohmed out for me but it was bad you know so when i ohmed it out and it ohmed out for me i said okay you know i ignored the the inlet valve and you know i went looking for and so i spent about a about 45 minutes wasting wasting time um and you know something told me to go back to that to that uh you know to that valve because it, it has a it had a flow meter in it and uh you know that that was my problem so this is going to be kind of hard to try to do but we'll use this to try to show it to you and you're just going to have to trust me for what the meter is going to read at but here we have a standard double coil now um if i measured both of these with continuity would it would it ping the same way this is a brand new right out of the box so if i measured this with continuity would i i have a, a beat yeah, yeah, you got both. Okay, so this is the difference between a continuity, uh, you know, tester or a resistance tester. Now, who knows why these would have different resistances? Different amount of more. pulls, right? The wraps. Right, yeah. Different what? The wraps, the coil wrappage, right? The what, amount of coils. What does that result to? That's more wire. Difference wattage wattage yeah okay, so uh, under the same load 120 ohm load if i had one that's reading 100 ohms and one that's reading 300 ohms i'm going to get a different wattage out of both of those right yeah so here we go we'll test one and i'm on the green solenoid right now Oop. so i can do this one-handed You guys can see that. So that's what, 235? 232. Okay, now we're going to go to the red one. One eighty. So brand new coils right out of the box with different resistance. Now, a continuity test couldn't tell the difference between it, but in, in reality, if you were to be looking at this in a home, this particular instance, I mean, you really wouldn't see too much of that in, you know, in, in, in real time. But it shows you the, the, the difference of continuity and resistance. And the, the, the answer to that is going to be wattage. So if you measured a dryer element and it was reading 36 ohms, and it's supposed to be 10 ohms, what kind of wattage resistance is that going to be on a 5,500 watt heater or a 1,500 watt heater? The difference of it being, you know, like, you know, getting real hot and not so hot, correct? Yeah. Our, yeah. our amperage is going to be almost double on, on the other one, right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, so, but some technicians are good and um, are book smart and can, can read through a schematic and tell you anything about it just by looking at the schematic. I mean, they can read it like a book. Other technicians are street smart and can look at a unit and just know because of how many they've done 400 of them in the past, you know, oh, this is what I want to look for and I'm going to jump right to this. The difference between both of those technicians is, you know, uh, um, both they're both going to come to the same conclusion eventually. But the experience from one technician versus the, the experience of another um, is going to, you know, define how they troubleshoot and how they go through it. So, 
training, you know, a dozen or so different technicians, um, you find some technicians are book smart and can read through a schematic and know everything about, um, you know, the, the unit because they can see a book. Other technicians are street smart and they, they can't read a schematic, but they've taken that unit apart 500 times and can know where every screw is by heart. So the, 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 the bottom line is, is a lot of different technicians have different uh, methods and approaches. The, the basic things you always wanna take in, into consideration is, is being able to identify it the way you do. Most importantly is when you get something and you complete it, um, just like TK's video there, test your repair, make sure it's completed. There is nothing worse than getting an hour down the road and getting a phone call because you, you know, you, you ran through the job and you just slapped it in and you took off before testing it because you didn't spend five, 10 minutes there making sure that your repair was done correctly. I mean, following the safety, following your troubleshooting methods, following your testing procedures are what's going to develop you as a technician. It's going to um, improve you as a technician and more, most importantly, going to make you more money. The more completes you guys get in the same, you know, in the same day, you know, bottom line, the more money you make. Um, that's about all the time I got. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to run through a bunch of uh, basic things with you guys and, and try to run through how, how to develop your approach and always follow safety first. No, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think that this is probably really helpful for uh, both the guys, some of the guys here, and then also for those that will be um, seeing the recording. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and like uh, segment out just this portion, and I'm gonna post it separate and separately from the entire night's meeting. Um, and I'll be uh, tagging that as an announcement so that people, you guys, can reference this. Any follow-up questions, that kind of stuff. Um, and I want to say that we're gonna continue doing. Um, this format where like the first third of each week's meeting will be touching on some sort of um, teaching and learning type of um, uh, scenario like this. So thanks again, Bobby. That was, that was awesome. Um, let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit. And um, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, pricing um, and uh, particularly around the approach that uh, some businesses take where um, they're able to message to their prospective customers, um, their customers that they have a service call fee. And then um, the service call fee uh, is applied to a, to a repair. Um, and some of the logistics and details around, um, you know, first of all, whether some of you guys do do that, some of you don't, um, and those that do, how you do it, other approaches, that kind of stuff. Um, Daniel, I, I, I I think I saw you earlier. Are you still around, Daniel? Did you want to um, did you want to uh, pose that question that you and I were talking about before the call? Yeah, let me see if I can uh, kind of make it make sense to everybody. So, in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, where we work mostly, uh, we have a lot of competitors that price their service visit at uh, going toward the repair if the job is completed. Otherwise, they have a, a certain price that they would charge. And I'm losing some business on these calls because, and it didn't seem to me that it ever was a problem for me when I was doing my, my phone calls and my secretary work. But uh, I have a secretary now that's been working for me for about seven years. And uh, I would say the past two years, it seems like we've had issues with other companies that uh, they'll do some calling around, the customer will, and once they find uh, kind of a, a person that would apply it toward the repair, they feel like they're getting a better deal going with that customer rather, or that company rather than going with us. And uh, I, I kind of explain it to them that they don't uh, break down the pricing as far as the invoice goes. So the customer may get an invoice for, say, $280 for the repair, but they don't know if that initial service visit was 
included in that or whether it's a, just actually been wiped off and uh, and applied toward the repair. So how do you guys go around that or or let me give you an example. So I had my secretary, um, she called me and she uh, said she just got off the phone with someone and she's having some trouble. And then uh, she actually texted it to me after the exact conversation. She said, uh, they asked how much we charge to go out. And she said, we charge a $75 service visit to come out. And that includes your diagnosis and your quote on any needed repairs. He said, so does that 75 go toward the repairs if we decide to get it done? And she said, I said, yes. And then in parentheses, she said, even though that doesn't make sense to me. And then she said, yes, it is included in the total quote that he will give you on the repairs. And then he said, wait, let me get that straight. Am I going to be paying for parts and labor on top of the 75? And she asked me what I would say at that point. And I basically explained that uh, when he's calling around, his question is the problem because, uh, however, we don't apply it toward the repair. We give you an upfront honest quote with a breakdown of the pricing. And uh, I, I think that would come across okay with the customer. But I guess what I'm wondering is, am I the only one that's having this problem when you're receiving phone calls and trying to get a booked appointment? Or do you have a way of overcoming that easily? Because it seems like I do, but maybe I need to write up a script for my secretary or something. What do you guys think? So I've got a little bit of input on that if you guys want it. Um, I've been running my business for about nine years now. It really comes down to wording and how you say things versus how another company is saying things. Because what you're talking about is not dissimilar to how I run mine which is I have an $85 service call fee. And I tell people it'd be $85 for me to show up, diagnose the unit. At that time, I'll give you a complete cost for the repair. And that 85 is included in that total. So I'll tell them, okay, I looked at your washer. It needs this, this, and this. The total for the entire job will be 265. That includes the 85. Cause I'll take that as a deposit to order a part or something like that. The big one that I run into in my area is I have a lot of service companies that say that they don't charge the service call fee if you do the repair. Yeah, so say, have you know, we have a, a $65 service call fee, but then if you do the repair, we're not going to charge you that. And I'll even see them, they'll, you know, on a breakdown on the ticket, they'll, they'll say $65 discount, but you can see in their labor charges and everything else, they've just written it into there to write it out someplace else. Right. And so I get a lot of customers that get upset with me. Well, they're going to discount me the service call fee. And I just tell them like, look, I'm being upfront. I'm telling you exactly what it's going to be for me to walk in the door and tell you what's wrong with your appliance. And then from there, I'll give you the quote for the remaining total that has the 85 included. You know, they're telling you they're going to discount it. Nobody's discounting it. They're just going to write it off into something else to make up the difference. Exactly. I'll jump in on this one because I've talked about this a lot. Nobody's waiving their service call fee. Nobody in this chat is actually doing it. You're saying that you're waiving it and you're you're pushing it into your labor costs. That's exactly what you're doing. That it's not. Uh, I, I have a little. I don't like the way that's worded when people do that. And if you do it, do you run your business the way you want to run it. But me personally, when I go out, get sixty five dollars, come out and diagnose, just like um. Uh, Brendan said and then if you know you choose to go with the repair that $65 is part of the entire bill so um, it's not it's just one of those things nobody's really waving it it's just a gimmick to make them think they're getting something when they're really not so I, I guess I can answer for the counterpart of this because I do I do credit it towards the repair I am one of those guys I'm the bad guy um, I do, I look at my PPC, my profit per call, and I look at all my bills. I look at all my, my overhead. I look at all my costs. And then I look at how many calls I'm running per month and I break it down. So my PPC, um, how much profit I want to make per call is about 185 to $200. And that's about my minimum. 
So I do credit the service call fee towards the, the any completed repair. So when I go to a home um, and I find out it's something, you know, very minor and I tell them, hey, man, the service call fee is, is all you got to charge, uh, all I'm charging you guys. This, this is a five minute repair. I can't really guarantee anything because I'm not charging you anything but the service call fee. And they're happy. Now, if I go to one where I'd say I'm uh, doing something, you know, uh, a heating element, you know, um, the, you know, markup on the heating element um, yeah, at retail, what I buy for wholesale combined with a, you know, a labor rate of 125, which includes a service call fee of the 75, you know, I, I'm usually around the 185, 200 mark. If not, I adjust my labor to, you know, to make it that way. But I do, uh, just like TK says, I absorb, you know, my service call into my labor. I give a fast quote, uh, I give a honest quote, and I'm able to get in and out. Now I do six to nine calls a day. So my PPC per day, you can add it up. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, so I, I do credit that and I, I do apply it towards there because I know what my numbers need to be. So yeah, I'm not, that's not what I was saying at all. I was, there's people out there that say service calls free. If you, if you go with the repairs, you're saying there's service calls towards the entirety of the repair. That's exactly how I do it. Right. I, I apply it towards any completed job. So uh, like, uh, if I go there and they've got multiple units, well, I do have an additional diagnostics fee and I'll apply that diagnostics fee towards that unit, the same as I did the service call towards this one. But um, yeah, yeah, I do apply it towards any completed repair. And I, I, I word it that way, you know, exactly supposed to, you know, like, because I, it's not, I don't come out and I don't charge you anything because I waive it. It's, you know, it's waived if you guys have a completed job. Yeah. And that's, that's and it's, it. it's, again, it's the same thing. It's, it's, you're writing it into what the final total cost is and it's how customers perceive it. But whenever people advertise it on their vans or on their, you know, phone calls or in their billboards that says free service call it, nothing's free. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, exactly. And that, that's the customers that they always tell me, they're like, no, they're going to give me a free service call. I'm sorry. I'm being honest with you. They're not giving you a free service call. They're billing that into the rest of their labor just the same as anybody else. It's yeah. just how they're saying it. Nobody gets anything for free. Yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump on that side of the fence with you guys 100%. No, yeah, I do not run calls for free. You know, there is a service call fee for me to come out. But now if I do a completed job, I will absorb that into the labor. I will not charge you 125 plus 75 plus the parts, you know, and go through it. I, I will absorb that in. Now, how much do you charge for the additional appliance fee? We charge thirty dollars for the additional appliance. Uh, I charge forty. Uh, extended area, forty-five. Okay. Yeah, we charge thirty. So we're right there with you. Mine's fifty. Expensive. I got to raise my prices. <laughs> I can't let no Kentucky boy get more money than me. <laughs> hey, you gotta take out all the competition. I'm the only one here. <laughs> yeah. There is a little difference when you have a monopoly on it. That's true. Hey, I got a question. If we can switch gears a little, is that okay, Alex? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm with that, uh, Daniel. Do, do you feel like you got a, a bit of an answer, guys, with what you're working? Yeah, on? absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, if you have yeah, anything we'll else, go ahead, Daniel. I don't want to interrupt by any means. Oh, no, you're good. I think that's great. Uh, so I think it's just basically I need to get it over to the customer and make them realize that that's a gimmick that they're doing. And uh, it's basically you're not getting it for free. You may think that, but. I, I do have one question about that. Um, it, when those comp, uh, customers talk about that company, um, what does that company's review? What is their posture? I mean, like, uh, what is their online presence? You know, do they actually have, um, you know, like legitimate reviews? Are they, you know, 2.0 rated, you know, like Billy Joe Bob, or are they, they are 5.0 rated company? No, they are a reputable company. They're probably about three stars though. So they're not great reviews. And uh, there's one of them that actually they'll give you a quote for the repair. And if you don't go with the repair, they'll charge you 25% of the quote. So let's say they charge you or quote you $800 for the repair. 
they're going to want $200 just to come out and diagnose it. Wow. Um, how do you guys feel about those companies that want to prepay the service call fee before they come out and do any work? Are you guys um, uh, against that? Are you for that? I personally don't I'm, get getting paid before I do the work because then I'm, I'm, I don't have the encouragement to go out there and finish it. I'm like, oh, I got paid. I'm good. I'm interested because uh, there are people that are doing that around here and it, it kind of in my opinion, preps the customer to pay and kind of gets rid of those people that are penny pinchers in my work and uh, they're not wanting to even get the repair done. They're more likely just to replace the appliance. So I, I'm interested in what you guys have to think on that one. Cause that's I've, exactly actually what I was going to bring up. So it's really funny that you brought that up. Yeah. No, and I, that was I can, my next question. Yeah, just oh. quickly to add in, and then TK, by all means, um, you know, kind of phrase it the way that you have it in your mind. But this is something that one of the businesses that I work with does do. Um, what does they ask for a deposit over the phone? So a portion of their service call fee, I believe their service call fee is $99.95. And then they um, require a, uh, a deposit of, I think it's about $50 to hold to essentially book the appointment. You're and then the they indicate to them uh, need to cancel that they just need to call. I think it's within twelve or twelve hours of the refunded refund. Uh, but that's kind of how they message that. I didn't catch all that, Alex. But I think uh, basically what you said was they take a deposit down half of ninety nine ninety five. That's what I thought. And you then. Basically, if they cancel within how long? I believe it was either 12 or 24 hours that they asked people to um, cancel by for a 100% refund. And this, gotcha. um, this helps separate, like, it, it helps people to pay. It also, they implemented it from a technical standpoint. So, Bobby, they actually use Razor Sync and the ability to automatically charge the service call or completed repairs or part ordering or something like that that's kind of why they implemented this because we'll take the card number over the phone the card is like anonymously stored in their system and then they can um, just get verbal um, approval from the customer to charge anything that's needed in the future hmm. Yeah, well, my this is the reason I brought this up. So I've been going over a bunch of my numbers and jobs from the last year. And I was going through looking at stuff from me and my partner and our technician. And I was noticing a lot of jobs where we would go out and um, there would be a note in there that said, waiting to hear from customer if they want to proceed with repair, if not need to collect $65. And there were several of them where I was like, all right, well, did we ever collect this $65? <laughs> and I was trying to figure out like, all right, well, this is obviously an issue within my company. I need to address this immediately. And that's something that me and my partner and um, our CSR has been discussing this week, the best way to do it. And one of the options was let's start collecting $65 up front. Do you document your payments when uh, you give a quote, like in a home? So, I mean, like they paid the service call fee and they will let us know if they want to complete the job. I mean, um, or do you do, are you all paper? All paper. Um, oh, all, you, you, I'm, no, no, no. It's all on dispatch. Excuse me. Okay. I was going to say, cause like uh, if any customer of mine calls up, you know, I can pull up the work order history and I can, you know, look at the notes on the ticket, you know, Hey, I was out. I, you know, I, this was the estimate they paid 75. They have a remain balance of this, you know, this is what we'd have to order. Right. And typically with my jobs, that's the way it goes, but it's not always the case with everyone else. Or at least that's the way the paperwork looks. I'd say that, and I would find it advantageous. I don't do it personally because I'm a very small business, and to do that, I'm the one that answers the phone, does the service calls, everything else, so I don't have the time and luxury to do that. Normally, it's get the customer information, get it logged, and move on. 
Uh, but the big thing, especially currently under the COVID thing in my area, a lot of service companies, including myself, sometimes are getting very far booked out. And so then we're finding people calling around, trying to find somebody else. You know, they've made an appointment with you. They talk to you on Monday. You have an appointment for Friday. They spend Tuesday and Wednesday calling around, trying to find somebody else. And then they call you on Wednesday, say, well, I talked to this guy and he's going to come Thursday. So I don't need your call on Friday. And then it's like, well, okay, I already set this time aside to service you. And now I've lost out. I've got to try and fill the gap. So it feels like it'd be advantageous in there, but it, for me, it seems that it, it doesn't happen enough to be worthwhile for the hassle on the backside to manage all that. I agree with that. Cool. Um, Is there anyone here that does collect the 65 up front? That's what I was going to ask about. Like with me, I, uh, I, I, that's what I charge to come out $75. And then, uh, if they don't do the repair, that's, that's when I collect the $75. But that, I hear you guys talking. I don't know if I'm, you know, cheap people or what, because I just do basically a flat rate. I look at their parts, see how much their part go cost. Like I did a bearing job for 175. Is that too much or? Is that no? That's I, too little. Yeah, that's little. too little. That's what I I, I thought. Maybe it's I was cheating myself out of a little bit because uh, yeah, it was like you should be getting at least two fifty in my on. area for a bearing job. Huh? How much is it? You should be in my area. It's about two twenty five to two fifty for a bearing job. Yeah, if you're pressing a bearing and not you know doing a entire yeah, gear casing or something like that. No, I'm pretty, yeah, that was that was like my second one. But as far as if they do the repair, I mean, it's like I said, I look up the average price for uh, a repair of such, and I kind of go off that average price, you know. Plus, they part like I use my cone, you know. We get we get our price and their price, and I charge them their price, you know. So I get a little bit out of that. I do that also, uh, but if I don't, they don't want to do the repair after, you know, with the doctor, if I'm there, then I collect the $75. So speaking of, uh, uh, hang on, I think you're muted. iPhone, you're muted. There you go. Uh, okay. Sometimes Marcone is uh, kind of cheap on their retail pricing. So I like to check a few other companies like Reliable Parts or appliance parts company or WL May and just check retail on it and make sure you're getting as much as you can on those parts because that bearing job you should have made yeah a lot more money on and and they don't know what the parts retail for most of the time anyway so even another five dollars on there just for your gas money is going to help you out yeah. yeah that's what I've been that's what I've been trying to do now I go to no reliable parts doctor. Uh, I just learned about it in Compass. Uh, and that's a couple more Sears. I'll go to and see what their prices are. And I've been using Sears a lot for part numbers, you know, to get the correct part numbers. Usually Marcone don't have the models, model numbers that I put in, you know. <laughs> so that's how I try to try to find my parts. So since you're bringing up uh, all these different uh, manufacturer and uh, um, uh, distributors, let's bring up uh, parts. Has, who's been having some issues on getting what and what have you been doing to get around it? Oh my I've God. I've been ordering off Amazon. Yeah, here's a big white elephant in the room, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous out there. Yeah, I've been waiting a month for parts for a refrigerator and these customers, man. <laughs> they get pissed. <laughs> if I'll anybody the has option. any Whirlpool dishwasher heating elements, I'll buy them from you tomorrow. <laughs> or I'll, I'll PayPal you the money tonight with a 20% uh, upcharge. Just you uh, charge them. You talking about that cow rod heater? Yeah, for the uh, Whirlpool dishwasher is a real common one. 
the ones with the little prong, little white prongs on the ends that, that snug in, or is it the black ones that go um, that lock over the top, little rubber, little rubber and metal pads? The little black pads. I think I have one, man. Oh, I need it so bad. Um, we get off here. I'll look in my truck and uh, I'll message you. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Huh? So, Mr. Say, Roberts will be very thankful. I was about to say I might have one, but I don't know if I want to give it up now. <laughs> Come on, bro. Hey, you're getting twenty percent markup, man. I was running into shortages of uh, Whirlpool dryer parts, two seven nine eight three eight heating elements. The maintenance dryer kits were gone for the longest time. They just started to roll back in. I mean, that in my area, those things are just, I, I usually carry six, eight of them on my truck because I go through them constantly and all of a sudden they were gone. So um, if you, a little trick that I do, um, you guys can do it however you want to do it. But um, my, my Marcone guy, his name is Andrew. So when I come in, um, I'm always asking Andrew or um, do you guys know the uh, vent dryer wizard guy? You know, you get the $25, you know, kickback card for any referral you send over there. I've heard of that, but I can't find one near me. Um, well, I get those in the mail because I refer them out and uh, I'll give Andrew my, my, you know, gift card ones. I'm like, hey, hey buddy, you know, lunch on me. And um, uh, I usually get a phone call. Um, he's saying, Hey, I got these elements, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready, you know, to, uh, you know, put on the shelf, you know, uh, I know you're going to be in in about an hour. You want me to put any, any of these in your box? I'm like, yeah, give me, give me five, give me, give me six. So um, prime example, the two wheel uh, whirlpool kit. You guys having a hard time getting those? Yeah, I am. I just got four. So yeah, I mean, uh, on certain things, it's um, it, it's it's good to you know like befriend uh, your uh, distributor. Yeah, I had a similar thing with my Marcone guy. I had two of them sitting on order that I was waiting on, and he called and said that they were in. And he goes, and we only got about a you know another fifteen of them in. I said, okay, well, why don't you grab a few more of them and throw them on the shelf, and I'll pick them up. So that that kind of reper repertoire with them really helps out. They can feed you information when you need it so um jumping back to that point of, uh, of, of topic um you guys ordering outside of your distributors how do you feel about that um ordering parts through amazon and are you marking them up or are you keeping them like you are and just taking less profit i've only had to do a few of them and i've generally just followed whatever the the retail pricing is that i can find for them my problem with doing them is i it's always hard to tell what quality of part you're getting if you're actually getting a factory part for some of the samsung lg stuff that'll you know say it's a factory part it's not it's a subco or it's something else you know but the the display or the sales sheet says it is and you just never know what you're getting out of it yeah so, i've been burned so many times on amazon maintenance kits for dryers and stuff wrong size I belt order from them yeah yeah so um, I, I was needing a jazz board, right? And I, I couldn't get one. Um, everything was back ordered on a jazz board when I was looking. And I found one on Amazon for $39. A jazz board. You know, the, the, the brake, you know, coated in, you know, the prefix yep. the model. Um, $39 for that, for that jazz board. Brand new. It was unbroken. Instruction manual. It was in it, you know, Elect, uh, ESD bag, you know, electronic shock, you know, uh, bag, everything. Um, yep. I put it in, it worked. Um, I kept, I've been installing those for probably three or four years now. Yeah. The you, you Amazon got thirty nine ninety five ones. Oh, you have, I, I've only done yeah. so far and, uh, I was, I was pretty damn impressed. I was like, Oh, it worked. Um, cool. <laughs> I do the I do the generic jazz board. I do the generic optic sensor board. I do the generic um, ADC boards, the adaptive defrost control boards with the red plastic diamond on the bottom. Yeah. I order all of those off Amazon generics. I've been using them for like three or four years. Never had one call back. Do you do the uh, mechanical swap out for the that's that side mounted one on the side of the side by sides for the ADC? I've done, you talking about switching over to a defrost timer? Yeah, the, the mechanical defrost, uh, was it a four pin? Yeah, I did it on one and I got a call back, so I haven't done it again. 
but I think it was my mistake because I think I put the um, I put I think I put the black wire in the wrong spot for that particular model. Gotcha. So I just stocked that generic um, ADC off of Amazon. I stocked that, the optic sensor board, and the jazz board. Oh, those are the three main, other than the uh, 942 GE board, those are really the only fridge boards I stocked. You talking about that 942, 942 Paul? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the GE one. Yep. Yeah, I see. I, I've done two of those in the past, like, 60 days. I, I was running through them like crazy for a while, but now I, I stocked two of them because I was using them so many and haven't sold one since. So, like, my philosophy on it is, you know, if I give a customer an estimate um, and let's say I go out there and uh, it's something additional, uh, um, I don't charge the customer, you know, any more labor. Um, I tell them, you know, we put it in, we'll take care of it. If there's an issue, you know, I'm, it, if it needs another part, well, it is what it is. I'll charge you for the part. That's it. You know, I try to be fair and uh, upfront. If there's a part that I can't get, um, and which I, um, that's why I do like using Marcone over reliable because if, uh, a part is unavailable. Marcone won't tell you that. I'm sorry. Uh, um, let me rephrase that. Uh, reliable won't tell you that. It'll just tell you it's a special order item, you know, or something like that. Right. Where if you look up Marcone, it'll tell you zero sold in 30 days. This item is no longer available. There's zero in stock, you know, across all the vendors. So when I run into something like that and, um, you know, reliable shows it for one seventeen ninety five, and I can't get one, but I can get it on Amazon for $74 where if I would have went through Marcone, I could have got it for 44. Well, I, my idealism on that is I eat 30 bucks. You know, I still give it to the customer for what it retailed at, you know, for what that is and what I quoted for. It's not their fault. You know, it, you know, parts aren't unavailable and I have to go through a different vendor. Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. What is y'all's uh, what is y'all's standard to... procedures as far as return trips? Like I've been reading some of the posts that guys post, and they talk about how they charge extra to come back. Like if you they go out and they have to order a part, they charge more to come back and put the part on. Is that everybody's pretty much for standard pricing procedure? Where because like my company. We charge you the same amount, whether it takes us one trip, two trips, or six trips. It's the right. same price. No, um, yeah. and I think that's the fairest way to do it for the customer. It's not the customer's fault if it took multiple trips. It's not the customer's fault if I didn't have the part. It's nobody's fault, but I feel like it's the fairest way to do it. How does everybody else? That's the cost that? of business. Yeah, that's not the customer's fault. That's the cost of business. Uh, you, are, you are a good man. It'll kill your reviews, too. Yes, my sir. competitor, yeah, my competitor does that, and his reviews are trash because of it. You don't know bio, do you? No, nope. I only do my model number. Say that again. I said I only do it if they don't give me a model number, and we've tried a couple times to get it. I know some people don't even go out if they don't get a model number. I've been thinking about that myself, but. What if it's an eighty-year-old lady and she can't right. get down underneath her oven, and you don't charge right. her an extra service call because you can't get your model yeah. number? Or they didn't I, know the dog tag. I, I, I have a heart, you know. It, it's case by case. <laughs> you know, I, I try to do the right thing, but you know, you make a judgment call. <laughs> 